Genesis 3 is our text this morning. The story is the story of the fall. We're looking at this in the context of our series of marriage and family so that we can understand why we've got such destruction and chaos in our families. We live in a culture that's broken, messed up, and consistently getting even worse. Thirteen years ago, when the shootings at Columbine happened in Colorado, we saw something that we really had never seen in our culture before. This week at the shootings at the movie theater, we saw it again. But it's almost like, oh, another shooting happened. Something else happened again. It's almost like we've become accustomed to it. Shootings on campuses, shootings in movie theaters, shootings on high school places. Our society is broken. Families are broken. Marriages are falling apart. Children are being abused. Women are used as sex objects. And men are anything but men. Adultery scandals, abusive marriages, neglected children. The question that is now being asked by young people isn't, when should I get married? But why should I even get married at all? Genesis 3, we find one of the most important chapters of the entire Bible. If we didn't have Genesis 3, if this was not here, little else of scripture, little else of life would make sense. If the Bible stopped at Genesis 2, we would have to say that the Bible is very irrelevant for us today. Because Genesis 2 is not reality of what's going on in our world today at all. Genesis 2 ends with this. There's no disaster, there's no chaos, there's no conflict, there's no struggle, there's no pain, there's no discord, there's no deterioration, there's no death. And yet we see all of that in our culture, in our society today. Genesis 3 explains to us why we need Jesus. It lays the foundation of why he is so needed in our lives. It explains why we can't ever get to where we want to be. It explains that no matter how hard we try to fix ourselves and fix our society, we can't make it a better place. This is why we look at the chapter today in the context of our series of marriage and family. I want to look at why we're in the mess today. Why do marriages fall apart? Why do relationships suffer? Why do children get neglected? Why are relationships so broken? And I want us to look in the mirror and examine our own selves in light of this this morning. By the time we're done this story this morning, we're not going to end in despair. We're not going to end it in bad note. We're not going to end in chapter 3, because chapter 3 is a depressing story. But we're going to go all the way from Genesis 3 all the way to Revelation 22, where everything is made right again. We're going to look at how God has a solution for this. And so we're going to look at this chapter together now. Verse 1 says, The serpent was more crafty, than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? After a beautiful time of celebrating the goodness of God's creation, the wonder of fellowship with God and others, the first marriage is now about to be attacked. Satan is lurking around in the garden, awaiting the perfect time to destroy what God has made. To say that The serpent is crafty as to say that he's thoughtful, skillful in the art of temptation. He's very good. As we examine the story and the temptation that Adam and Eve face, I want you to see the parallel between your life as well. You'll find the same lies, the same thoughts, the same approach in your life as well. He's observing this woman. He's watching her. We don't know the timeline between Genesis 2 and Genesis 3, how long it's been, how long Adam and Eve have been in the garden. But there's been some time that's gone by. He notices there's something that he can use in their lives to destroy um, their relationship, to destroy their marriage, to destroy their relationship with one another, to destroy their relationship with God. There's something that he can pull out of them that can actually make them go against God and make them who made them and cause them to cherish something else other than God. He found that they were vulnerable in their affections, especially for the things that they did not know. There was curiosity that actually ended up killing them. The rest of scripture will tell us, but the serpent is actually Satan. Satan is the one who's behind this whole thing. Sometime between the completion of creation and Genesis chapter 3, somewhere in that time frame, Satan falls from heaven. He rose up against God. He was created to be a worshiper. He was perfect. He was beautiful. He decided that one day he wanted to be like God. And we'll notice here that he will try to get Adam and Eve to think, the very same thing in our story. 
So he stands up against God. God kicks him out of heaven. He's doomed to roam the earth, and he's sentenced to eventually face condemnation, judgment, and hell. His tactic is very simple. He uses a line of questioning to plant doubts into their minds. He starts off with questions that are actually very absurd. The first question is an absurd question. Did God tell you that you can't eat anything in the garden? Adam and Eve are now put on the defensive. Of course God never said we can't eat anything. We can eat everything except this one tree. Satan is planting doubts, putting them on the defensive, and now they have to defend God. Verse 3, verse 2, the woman says to the serpent, we may eat of the tree, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. If you observe her statement, her statement is filled with a ton of problems. The first thing you should catch your imagination is, why in the world is this woman talking to a snake? I mean, why is she talking to an animal? The second thing you have to ask is, where is Adam in the whole story? If you read the chapter, if you read chapter 2, what we looked at last week, we see how Adam was created first, how he was supposed to help her, lead her, protect her, like a gardener that takes great detail in growing his garden. He was supposed to water, nourish, remove weeds or things that would be an obstacle in, her life, in, the, in the plants growing. He was supposed to do the same thing for his wife and family, nourish her, protect her, remove obstacles in front of her. So you have to ask the question, where's Adam? Where in the world is the man? It seems like he dropped his guard. He's not protecting her as he should have been. So you... You can object and say, should Eve follow Adam around everywhere he goes and just stay by him the whole side? Is that what God wanted her to do? Not necessarily. She was free to roam the garden anywhere she wanted to go. She was free to go in different directions. She didn't have to be connected to his hip bone. She didn't have to be stuck to him. But that's not exactly what's going on here in our story. Verse 6 tells us that she took the fruit and gave it to Adam who was standing with her. He was right there. The idea of the language is that Adam was standing there the whole time. He wasn't busy planting or taking care of the garden and left Eve alone. Adam was standing right there with Eve as he watched his wife get played. He just sat there and watched it. Even before there was a need for clothes, we find man wearing a skirt in the relationship. The next thing that you notice is Eve's response is a little gullible. She's also starting to doubt God's goodness here. Here's what she says. Listen, Mr. Snake, we can eat any tree in the garden. If you haven't been eating it, you should try it. These are good fruit. It's actually really good. There's one thing that God said that we shouldn't eat of. From the tree or we're dead, we're toast. There's one tree. Oh, yeah, that tree, the one that you're hanging off of. That one, we're not even supposed to eat from it. We're not even supposed to touch it. We're not even supposed to look at it. We're supposed to stay far, far away from it. We've always wondered what the tree looked like. We always wondered what the fruit smelled like. We always wondered what it tasted like. But we wouldn't dream of doing it because God told us not to touch it. So she takes away so many things here. First off, she takes away what God said. God says in verse 2, you can eat of any tree in the garden except this one exception. What's she doing? She's concentrating on the one thing that God says she can't do. First thing that comes to her mind is not that hey, we can enjoy all of these blessings that God's given us, the first thing that comes to mind is the one thing that God says we can't do. Listen, when God has rules and laws for your life, it's just like any good parent that has rules. Like my son, Tim, don't play with knives. Nicole, don't play with fire. Tim, don't hit your sister. There are things that are very, very important that you don't do in the household. These are rules. These are laws that are good for you. These are simple rules that a loving parent gives to a kid. And this is what God's doing. He gives them one simple rule and that they need to obey. Don't we do that? Even with problems in our lives. We we forget when we're going through problems, the only thing we can focus on is that one little problem, right? And we completely forget all of the blessings, all of the goodness that God has in our lives because we're so focused on the one negative thing. And here's Eve. She forgets that God's given her a garden. She says, you can eat of any tree. You can be blessed to eat anything you want. But she's focused on this one little tree, this one little thing that God says not to do. I want you to notice another thing. In chapter 2, the tree of life was in the center of the garden. God says, 
the tree of life, the life, the tree that will help you live forever, is in the center of the garden. But Eve makes a very subtle comment here. If you go back to Eve's statement, she says that the tree that is one that she's not supposed to touch, the tree of good of knowledge, that tree is in the midst, in the center, in the middle of the garden. Her entire view of the garden has shifted. It went from the tree of life being in the center to now this tree of knowledge and good, which God told her not to eat. That tree is right in the middle. It's now the most important thing. It's the center of the garden. Another thing she does is she softens the blow. God says, if you eat the tree, you will die. Eve says, oh, lest we die. Oh, if we eat it, we might die. We might happen. Notice, God didn't even say you can't touch it. Eve now adds words to, Adam's, uh, to, God's, to God's sayings. Eve made that up. She's like a good Pentecostal. Degrees of separation has to be there. Um, you don't want to sin, so don't go to a movie. Don't go to this. You don't want to, God says don't do this, so let's, uh, let's build a wall around it so we don't even look at it or touch it. We can't even look at it unless we be tempted. They're creating additional rules and putting additional words into God's mouth. Don't touch the tree. Stay away from it. Satan has her hook now. He has her thinking that God is holding out on him. And on that second of curiosity, Satan jumps in. Look at verse 4. The serpent said to the woman, You shall not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. He wastes no time. He doesn't continue to tempt her. He goes right for the kill. He goes right after her and tells her a straight lie. This is what he does. He feeds you lies. Every sin that you fall into is because the devil feeds you lies. Some of you don't know the lies that Satan tells you because you don't know the truth that God tells you. Satan lies to you, and because it sounds good, you think it's probably from God. Listen, this is why we emphasize you need to be in the Word of God, reading it, knowing it, studying it. It's preparation for battle against the enemy. Satan is lying about the Word of God. And if you don't know the Word of God, you will believe anything that he tells you. So be prepared for it. Satan tells him, there's no way you're going to die. You guys are so gullible. You guys are missing out on so much. God really doesn't love you because if he did, he wouldn't hold out on you like this. Listen to me. I'm your friend. I came here to talk to you. I'll tell you a secret. God has other motives here. He's holding out on you guys here. He doesn't want you to know some good things. So you guys should outwit him. You guys should outsmart him. You guys should outthink him. You guys should think faster than him. You should jump ahead of him. I know this garden is nice and pleasant, but it's a gigantic ploy to keep you in your place because God feels threatened by you. He's threatened by you. Don't let God keep you down. This tree is your only chance to reach your potential. In fact, if you don't eat of it, you'll die because you're not being what God created you to be. He's completely twisted everything God said. What he's doing here is he's tempting Eve with pride. Eve, you're more important. You need to look out for yourself, Eve. Do you realize that pride is a sin? I know that's contrary to what culture teaches and what society says, that you should be proud and you should esteem yourself. I know it's esteemed as a virtue in our culture, but do you realize that Scripture teaches that pride is sin? Do you realize that it's a sin, even if it's called self-esteem? It's still the same thing. This is the same lie that Satan feeds you. The reason that you're in the condition that you're in, the reason that you have problems, the reason that you face is because you don't love yourself enough. You have a low self-esteem. You need to think more highly of yourself. You need to go out and get those things that God hasn't given you. If God hasn't given it to you, then you need to go out and get it. If God hasn't given you a spouse, a husband, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, then you need to go out and get one. Who cares if they believe in Jesus or not? You've got to think about yourself. You've got to think about your future. You've got to think about your life. Who cares if they believe in Jesus? You need more money? Go out and get it. Who cares if you have to cheat to get it? You need more sex? Go ahead and sleep around. Who cares? It's about your pleasure. It's about your joy. It's about your happiness. This is what Satan does. He wants to think... He wants you to think only about yourself. It's not a new trick. It didn't even start in the garden. This is exactly what he did in heaven. Go, reach your destiny, fulfill your dreams, be number one in the world. This is what the world tells you. 
It doesn't tell you that when you do and you neglect God's law, that you're acting just like Satan, not like God. That you don't become like God, you actually act just like Satan does. Every little word begins now to sink deep into Eve's heart. And she actually begins to wonder if God loves her at all. I don't think God loves me. I think God's holding out on me. I think God's really not letting me enjoy life. All of a sudden, she feels aggravation for an injustice that doesn't even exist. Wait a minute. Why can't I enjoy this fruit? And now she's created in her mind an injustice that doesn't even exist. Look at the next verse. So the women saw the tree was good for food. It was a delight to the eyes. And the tree was to be desired to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate, and she gave to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Now we get a peek into her thought process. Sin has already been conceived in her heart. She looks at the fruit and she saw that it was good. It began in the mind. Here's what she thinks. It doesn't look deadly. Does it? I mean, it's fruit. How can a fruit kill me? How can God prohibit such a good thing? Why would God put this in front of me? This great thing. Why would he put it in front of me and not let me want to have it? After all, God created me to enjoy the garden, didn't he? He created me to enjoy creation, to enjoy life. God created me to enjoy the world that he put me in. And this is what exactly what's going on through Eve's head. If I don't enjoy this now, I may never have another shot at this. Selfishness plus impulsiveness equals compromise. Selfishness plus impulsiveness equals compromise. We live in a selfish, impulsive culture. You gotta have it, you gotta have it now, you got, it's gotta be about you, and it equals compromise that leads to sin, that leads to destruction. This is why Proverbs reminds us that there's a way that seems right to man, but the end thereof is the way of death. Eve decides that she's gonna eat. She rips the fruit down with all of her might. She takes the biggest bite that she could eat. She turns over and gives it to her husband who's standing by her, completely quiet, observing this whole conversation. He starts eating it as well. They think they got freedom. They think they have outsmarted God. They think that now they're able to enjoy the delights and the pleasures of sin and get away with it. And the reality is something completely different happens. Look at the next verse. The eyes of both of them were opened. They knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and the wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord who was among the trees of the garden. If the story wasn't so sad, it would actually be amusing. Here's what they're trying to do. They're trying to hide from God behind a tree. Picture that. They swallow the first bite. They had the, the strange feeling come over them. They're waiting for something magical to happen, for them to be transformed like God. And instead of this great dream come true, they experience a nightmare. Instead of light, they get darkness. Instead of understanding, they get confusion. Instead of love, they get shame. Instead of joy, they get sadness. They suddenly, their eyes are opened, as Satan said it would, but it's not at all like they thought they would be. It's like an oncologist that knows about cancer, he knows it better than any patient that has it. He knows all about the ins and outs of it. He knows the treatments for it. But if the patient knows it in a completely different way, they experience it. They feel it. They know it. And this is what happens to Adam and Eve. They went from being like God to now not being like God at all anymore. They went from being holy, perfect, created beings to now being sinful, marred, creation. They actually experience it. They have it inside of them now. All of a sudden, they realize they were naked. They were naked before, but now they feel naked. They didn't want anyone to see them. Instead of now, instead of making something out of the world for God's glory, now they're making something out of the world to cover their own glory. This is what they're doing. They completely inverted the process that God had made them for. And the rest of human history is this process. The rest of human history is the covering of fig leaves, 
We spent most of our days, most of our times, most of our minutes thinking of ways that we can cover ourselves. How can we give off a persona that we're okay, that we will cover ourselves by being a hard worker, by being a good parent, by being a good neighbor, by being a good roommate, by being having good friends. We'll cover ourselves with the things that we do around us so that people will stay away from us and won't know how we really are inside. This is what we do. This is the birth of hypocrisy, fig leaves. We cover ourselves with things to make us look good. So God calls to the man and says, where are you? It's a rhetorical question. This is God saying, Adam, what have you done? Adam, where in the world are you? God knows where he's at. Adam says, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. God's walking along. And think about this. Every other day, when they hear God walking into the garden, they'd run to him because the Father is coming to see them. And they would get excited, then they run to the Father. And now they sin, and what do they do? They run from him. Isn't that the same thing of our lives? When we're serving God and loving God, we run to him. But when we sin, what do we do? We run and hide and think that even God doesn't love us, isn't it? This is kind of like when you're a teenager and you hear your parents come home and you're scrambling to get everything out of the house or get your house cleaned up. You're panicking, trying to hide whatever you could hide. Maybe you guys have never done that, but um, I grew up up north. It was completely different. This is what Adam and Eve um, were doing. God's like, Adam, I know where you are. Come out. Who told you you're naked? Image reminds me of my son. Um, when he was younger, he would uh, want to play hide and seek. And so I'll say, Tim, go hide. And what he would do is he'd close his eyes. And he'd think that because his eyes are closed and he can't see anything, he's hidden, right? And, like, I can't find him. So I'm like, where in the world did Tim go? That's exactly what Adam's doing. He's trying to hide from God who sees everything. I mean, a tree is going to hide you from God? I'll close my eyes and it'll all disappear. All my problems will disappear. In theology, we call this story the fall of man. Man begins to tumble down a moral cliff and becomes broken. The result of the fall means we have spiritual alienation from God, emotional alienation from within, social alienation from one another, physical alienation from the world. Everything begins to fall apart now. God's beautiful creation is broken. It's important for you to understand from this point forward, mankind doesn't get better at all. It's, we feel like somehow we're better than we used to be, that we're better than we were 100 years ago, that we're more advanced in culture. We feel like we're important, more special, more intelligent than people were 100 years ago because we're advancing, but that's not the case at all. We may have greater technology than our grandparents did, but we're not progressing. In fact, the events of this week in Colorado remind us that we're degenerating as a society that we're destroying ourselves. We're not working toward utopia. The world's not getting better. Paul reminds us in 2 Timothy that this world will go from bad to worse. Everything begins to unravel now. Everything begins to die, even though it was supposed to last forever. Look at verse 11. God says, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? And man said, the woman that you gave to me, she gave, birth, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. Here's Adam. I'm completely innocent, God. It wasn't my fault. No one wants to fess up. No one wants to take ownership. No one wants to repent. They're playing the blame game now. Instead of maturing like Satan promised, they actually become more immature. They're like two little kids pointing the finger at each other. We become, a, we become good at this as a, as a society. We have become a blame society. No one takes responsibility for their actions anymore. When's the last time you saw a criminal go before the judge and admit that he was wrong and be punished? What we've done in this society is put blame on everyone else. I don't mean to bring up the topic of Des Bryant this week, um, mostly because I'm not a Cowboys fan, but he was arrested this week for physically assaulting his own mother, right? But even this week, sportscasters on the radio were talking more about how he personally would probably get off because his mother's past record of drugs, arrests, having him as a child at the age of 14. All the responsibility is on the mother, even though he's the one that's abusing her. No, don't take responsibility that you shouldn't abuse another being. 
human being. Let's find someone else to blame for our problems. We all do this. We always find a reason or excuse to blame someone else for our sins. If we can't find another human being to blame, what do we do? The devil made me do it. It's the devil's fault. We all make excuses. And this goes all the way back to Genesis 3. The battle begins here in this chapter. The man steps up and takes leadership role in the first one to speak. It's only because he sees God's there. God there. God hears. I can tell him what the woman did. I can blame her. I can tell God exactly how she screwed up. I can maybe come out of this. Okay, she'll get punished. I'll look good. He's trying to prove his manhood. He stands up quickly, deflated, and he's quickly deflated because he doesn't speak out of love. He tries to blame and talk about his innocence in the whole matter. He basically says, God, this woman that you gave me, you know, the one that you created, at first this was a good deal. We got along well. She was cooking great food. We had a great relationship. She's walking around here naked. Everything's perfect. This is a great deal. Now she's clothed herself. She's given me bad food to eat. I need counseling, God. I need therapy. I'm a victim in this situation. In fact, you need to give me an upgrade because this one is not working. It has some serious flaws with it. I need another one. This is all her fault. She has defects. I was actually fine, God. I was doing well. And then you had to go and make me this woman. If you had left me alone without giving me this woman, I would have been just fine. You made her as a helper. She's not a helper at all. She actually took me down with her. This is not good at all. Do you hear in the words that he's actually accusing God of something? He's actually blaming God for his sin. God, you made this woman. This is your fault, God. And he's even going further than just blaming someone else. He now blames God. Eve jumps in. God, it wasn't me. It was a serpent. The devil made me do it. It wasn't my fault. If he hadn't been there, if he hadn't said the things that he said, I never would have done this. I was so good up to this point. Listen, guys, men, you need to understand this, especially in the context of your family and marriage. If things go wrong in the home, if things are not good in the home, if your kids aren't doing well, if communication between you and your wife is broken down, at the end of the day, it is your responsibility. It's your responsibility. But, but, God, but she's like this. No, it's your responsibility. This is why God addresses the man first. Eve was the first to sin, yes. In a way, Adam had sinned in this area way before Eve did because he sinned in the act of omission, not standing up and protecting his wife from the serpent. It was a man's responsibility. Think about it. In the family and relationships, we invert the very gospel that we believe. We actually believe a false gospel in our relationships. Here's what the gospel is. Paul says this. Here's a trustworthy statement. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I'm the worst. That's the gospel. This is the understanding of an individual and application to the gospel. But what do we do? We say this. Christ Jesus to came into the world to meet needs of whom I have the most. We completely invert the gospel. It's no longer about me being the chief of sinners and me being in need of Christ. It's about this person and their faults, and because of what they did, that's why I am the way I am. Instead of understanding that, God, I'm a screwed up, messed up person, and I need your grace, we quickly turn around and try to blame all of our problems on someone else. And instead of running to God for help, say, God, help me, we say, God, would you fix her? Or God, is this your fault for bringing her into my life? Or your fault for bringing him into my life? And we invert the very gospel that we believe. So now God places a curse on them. He begins to address them. He addresses the serpent first. He has a come to Jesus meeting with the serpent. He calls the culprits into the center. We have the serpent, Adam, Eve, and all of creation is watching, waiting to see what happens. So he says to the serpent, because you've done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all fe beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. He begins by placing a curse on the serpent, decreeing a list of consequences that will go on indefinitely. 
He dooms him to be an isolated, miserable creature. The curse is placed on the rest of creation here because it says that Satan is cursed above all of the other creation. In other words, I'm going to curse them too, but you're cursed above all of them. All of creation is cursed because of what happened in Genesis 3. This is why we have disease, disaster, decay, and death. Nature itself will become destructive now. Floods, earthquakes, droughts, famines, hurricanes, tsunamis, other natural disasters. We call this in our culture acts of God. And in a sense they are because, they're, because God is sovereign. But they're also acts of man because of our sin. Because of the sin of humanity. This wasn't the way it was supposed to be. God speaks to Satan and says a battle is now going to begin between him and mankind. The battle will be culminated in a particular son of Eve's. Satan knew that one of Eve's son would eventually be his doom. He didn't know who it would be, when it would be. So he now begins to attack the family. And he attacks one family after another, trying to destroy marriages, trying to destroy children. Because he didn't know who it would be, he just declared war on all of us. And here God gives the first gospel presentation as well. God says there's hope. There's someone that's going to come and rescue and make this right. There will come a day when Jesus will come, and though Satan will bruise his heel, he will die at the cross. Christ will ultimately crush his head when he rises from the grave. He would destroy him. Look at verse 16. He looks to the woman. He says, to the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. God looks at the woman and says, this whole thing is going to cost you a lot. This whole idea of being fruitful and multiply, which was supposed to be a good thing, now it's going to be painful for you. This is why one out of every four pregnancies end up in a miscarriage. This is why children are born with birth defects. All of the pain, all of the suffering that will come is because of sin that has now entered the world. The sad result is that sin will go deeper than just Eve being a mother. It would mean also pain as a wife. She will either suffer conflict with her husband or she will suffer domination by her husband. The phrase here, you shall, your desire shall be for your husband, in English that sounds nice. Oh, nice, before she didn't desire me, now she desires me. That's not what... God's saying here, it's not saying that, hey, before the fall, Eve didn't desire him. He's saying that um, it's the idea of overstep or dominate. Her desire for you is not good. It's to rule you, to dominate you, to subjugate you, to force you to do things. This is what he says will happen because of the curse. The woman will actually now desire to dominate and rule over. He says the opposite will happen. He will actually rule over you. This is the birth of feminism. Starts as little girls, right? You women know how to manipulate men. My daughter knows how to manipulate me. She knows how to look at me, get teary-eyed, and get exactly what she wants whenever she wants. We do this all the time. And forgive me, but you either yell and scream at your guy, and he's tired of you hearing you yelling and screaming, so he gives you what you want. Or if you don't get that, the faucet turns on and you start getting teary-eyed and tears just start falling down and so he gives you what you want. Or you turn it all off. You don't yell or scream. You don't cry. You just give him the silent treatment. And he gets frustrated and can't live with that. So you get what you want. You're good at this. This is part of the curse. It goes deeper. He says that he will rule over you. Instead of lovingly leading and protecting her, the text, says, the text says that now he will rule over her like with a flat iron, with an iron fist. He will try to dominate her. He will not be considerate of her, not love her, not lead her. He will now try to treat her as a child. This is the birth of male chauvinism. We see both of this here, feminism and male chauvinism. The conflict arises and we have two sexes now battling. John Piper says the following, he says, when sin entered the world, it ruined the harmony of marriage, not because it brought headship and submission into existence, but it twisted man's humble, loving headship toward hostile domination in some men and lazy indifference in others. It twisted women's intelligent, willing, happy, creative submission toward manipulative um, control in some women and brazen insubordination in others. 
Sin didn't help create headship and submission. It ruined it and distorted them and made them ugly and destructive. You see why we're in the mess that we're in? You see why we're broken? You see my marriages fall apart? You see why there's communication problems? You see, we're on a runaway train on a broken track. And it's only by redemption that things will be restored back to the way they're supposed to be. Verse 17, Adam says to her, and to Adam he says, because you've listened to the voice of your wife and eaten of the tree by which I've commanded that you shall not eat of it, cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. God now turns his attention to Adam, and he addresses him. He says that the role of providing for your family is going to be hard. His work, which used to bring him joy, will now break his heart. You should expect that things are not going to always be easy for you. Work will not always be fun. It'll be hard. Some of you are incredibly idealistic about your vocation. I hate my job. I need to find another job. Listen, there will be days you'll hate any job you're in, even if it's the perfect job. Why? Because your work is cursed. It's broken. You work with broken people. You work with messed up people. Listen, you work there. That explains a lot. It has thorns. It has thistles. It's hard. It's difficult. The reason they pay you is because you wouldn't do it for free. Right? That's why they have to pay you. If you're willing to do it for free, they wouldn't pay you. Everything that man touches falls apart. Notice where the curse is also applied. It's applied to the natural places of life. God's designed it from the beginning that man would take responsibility for the family through working and providing. While work should while the work should take while the man should take responsibility while the women should take responsibility by having children and nurturing and caring for them. Supporting the family was the primary responsibility of the man. Caring for the home was the primary responsibility of the wife. Notice I said primary. This implies that man should feel the responsibility to work and provide for his home. You are the ones that are responsible. It doesn't mean that she can't help you. It doesn't mean that she can't work. It doesn't mean that at all. But it is your responsibility at the end of the day to put food on the table for your family. It's your responsibility to meet the financial needs of your home. On the flip side, the wife is primarily responsible for the caring of the home. But it doesn't mean the husband is supposed to neglect the children. It is your responsibility and your role as fathers to touch them, influence them, to encourage them, to be a loving father to them. It goes both ways. Guys, you need to be involved with your kids, loving them, shepherding them, taking care of them. Let me get to the final point, hope. Verse 20. The man calls his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and Eve garments of skins and clothed them. Hear words of hope. I'm going to call this woman Eve, mother of all living. This means that human race will not end with them. By that very statement, I'm going to declare that you are the mother of all living. We will not end the human race. Something good is going to happen from this. Adam believed that something good was going to happen. There's hope here, even in the curse. The chapter closes by God sending them out of the garden. Sin had come into God's perfect world, and it would never leave now. God's children would always be running from him, hiding in the darkness. Their hearts would break now. They would never work properly again. They would never be everything that God had designed for them. God couldn't let his children live forever, not in this condition, not in this pain, not in this brokenness, not in this sin. God cannot allow them to live in that condition. The only loving thing that God could do was to actually send them away. He had to send them out of the garden. God didn't shake his hands free of Adam and Eve at all, though. He doesn't reject them. and He doesn't just neglect them. That wasn't God's plan at all. He just could not allow them to stay in that situation. There's only one way to protect them. There was only one way to get them back, and that was to send them away and to keep them from coming back to this area and eating of the tree of life where they could live forever. 
But before they leave the garden, I want you to notice a couple things. One, God closed them. God lovingly clothed them. He covered them. He sent them on a long journey out of the garden, out of their home. And instead of having them come back, which he knew he couldn't do, not in the sin that they were in, he went after them instead. He sent them away, but then he himself goes and pursues them. He sent them out of the garden so that he could go and rescue them. If they had stayed there, if they had eaten of the tree of life, they would have lived forever in a broken condition that they were in. But God had a greater plan. He sends them out so that he could go and rescue them. Even though he would suffer, God had a plan. One day he would get his children back. One day he would make the world their perfect home again. One day he would wipe every tear from their eyes. His love was too deep. His glory was too great for them to let them go on this way and just stay in the garden. Before they left the garden, God whispered a promise in the year of Adam and Eve, I will come and rescue you. I will send myself to come and rescue you. I'm going to go do battle with the serpent. I'm going to get rid of sin. I'm going to get rid of sadness. I'm going to get rid of pain. And he does. This is where the story picks up in the New Testament. God himself steps into human history. He comes down in the form of God's son, Jesus Christ. He comes into the world. And instead of falling for the temptation of Satan, he doesn't fall for them at all. Think about it. Jesus gets baptized, and where does he go? He goes into the desert, into the place where Adam and Eve were sent into. He gets there, and what happens? He's tempted by Satan. They're in the wilderness. Jesus resists all the temptation. He does exactly what Adam could not do. Adam failed. He sinned, broke everything. Jesus came and did everything perfectly, resisted all temptation. Instead of stumbling, he would stand. Instead of running away, he plunged himself into it and fixed it. The curse that had doomed mankind for history to suffer and die and the penalty of sin was now going to be absorbed by God himself. That's a crazy story. The only way that God could kill sin without killing us was to go and take the penalty for sin on the cross and to die on our behalf. Galatians 3.13 says that God redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. To redeem is to buy back or to set free. Jesus literally became the curse for you. God applied all that was due to you. Because of the fall, Jesus took all of that on himself on the cross. The cross was the public display of God's curse. Do you realize that Jesus had to die on the cross? Do you realize that he had to be a public display to be hung on a tree? To display that God would apply the curse, all of sin, all the brokenness that was in humanity. The cross wasn't an accident. It didn't just happen. Jesus was born in the fullness of time. It was the perfect time. The cross was in the heart of God from all eternity. Jesus is called the Lamb of God that was slain before the foundations of the world. All of this was in God's plan. He always had the cross in mind. He always knew his son would die to rescue and bring you back. And then you have a choice. You can choose to bear the curse on yourself and work away and toil away to fix yourself, to make it all work, to keep working hard, to absorb all of your life and all of your time to be consumed by yourself. Or you can repent from all of that and you can turn to be Jesus who absorbed absorbed all of it for you. God will restore the world. God will take anything that is broken and will fix it. That's not the, this, this is the end of the Bible. Revelation 21 says that he will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. Can you imagine Adam and Eve hearing that? Because that's all they experience at this moment. Death, tears, crying, mourning, regret. And God says, I'm going to take it all away. And the story ends in Revelation 22 where God ends by saying, there shall no longer be any curse. There will be no more curse. It's gone. How could he do that? How can he remove it? It's because of Jesus. Because God absorbed the curse and everything that was broken in his son, in your place. That's the good news. That's the resolution for the third chapter of Genesis. This is the hope that we have. It's only in understanding that gospel and getting yourself 
absorbed in that message, only then can you be changed. Only when you're overwhelmed by the truth that Christ died for you, only then can you change your relationships that you're in now. Only when you have hope that one day the curse will be completely gone, can you have hope in the relationships that you're in now. We're not left alone. There is hope. We're not left to fend for ourselves. He's with us. He helps us. This morning as we come to the table, the table is a reminder that while we were broken, that while we were sinners, while we wanted nothing to do with God, while we were completely destroying our lives, Christ came to rescue us. Christ came to save us. So that every relationship you're in could work because he's there with you. Your marriages can work because he resides inside of you to guide you, to help you. Your friendships can work because the Holy Spirit is there to tell you how to live. Your walk with God is restored because of Jesus. So this morning as we come to the table, we don't come because of our own goodness or our own righteousness, but we come because of Jesus. And we don't come saying, God, look at what I've done. But we come saying, God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for your son. Thank you for your savior. As you come to the table this morning, I invite you to examine your own life. Are you living for yourself? Are you absorbed with all the things that you want? What about in your marriages? Are you so consumed with your desires and your wants instead of laying your life down like Jesus commands you to do? Are you living only for your desires? What about in your relationships with your friends? What about in your relationships with your family members? What about in your relationships at your work? Is it all about you? Are you consumed with yourself? Or do you realize that you were saved for a much bigger purpose than you just simply being successful, you to be simply being rich? But that God in his, the richness of his mercy came and rescued you while you were the worst of sinners. Not simply to fix you, but to make you a brand new creation. So when we come to the table, would you come in an act of worship? If there are areas of your life that you need to repent, would you repent? And would you come to the table recognizing that Christ, I need your help. I need you. I need your strength to live my life. I need your grace in my marriage. I need your grace in raising my children. I need my grace. I need your grace in how I respond to my parents. I need your grace in every relationship that you put me in. And would you come to the table in an act of complete surrender, complete worship for what he's done for you? Let's worship.